So viewers today I'm going to be doing something different from my usual videos. I'll be interviewing David Corson who knew two of the deceased i.e. Anthony Tucker and Pat Tate. I'll be doing a few interviews with David about not just Anthony Tucker and Pat Tate but other people he has met linked to this case. Hi David, so how did all this start and how did you first come into contact with one of the Essex boys? Right Craig, right okay. okay. What it is, I first started working doors when I was 17 years old and I had a night in a club called Zhivago's in South Bend on C Essex and that is where I first met Tony Tucker who was head doorman. As I said, I was 17 at the time, I believe he was probably about mid-20s and that was the first night that I met him and worked at the club. Now, I don't tell lies, swear my kids' lives, this is what happened. There was a young girl who come up at the club. Obviously, she's clearly under age. I'd say she's under legal age, but certainly she was under 18, right? And Tucker took her out the back and had a fiddle with her. Then he invited others and myself, if we wanted to go out there, obviously he'd go through the little bird. Well, I declined because I was with a serious girlfriend at the time, so I didn't bother. But there was another fellow who did, but, you know, it weren't my thing. So, and that was it. So I see on that night that he had a thing for younger girls. And clearly this girl is obviously to be used like that would be vulnerable. And that's all I can say on that. Like I say, I swear my kids' lives, that's true. I don't tell fucking lies and that's sad. So there you go. I left that because I was working part-time. I had a full-time job at the time. I was at the Eastern Electricity Board in Chelmsford, which is the main electricity company. And then from there, I moved to a club which was on the side of a hotel in Basildon called Fat Sam's Cranes Hill Farm, I believe it is, or Cranes and Industrial Estate. The hotel's still there. It's on the side of a big lake. And that is where I met Big Lee Chapman, a good friend of mine, known him many years now. 41 years, I think, now, Big Lee. So anyway, I started working there. So I moved from South End of Basildon. And I worked there, as I say, part-time for a number of years. And then there was a club opening up, Hollywoods in Ipswich. Now, there was a sister club, Romford, what I've been running for a while. And I've done a few nights there. I know all the lads there. And I know everyone, basically, in Essex, all the doormen. It's a small circle of people, good group of fellas. Um, going back then, you know, completely different to the sort of dormant today. That's no disrespect to them, but it was completely different, different people, and you could get away with a lot more, obviously, than what you can do today. So, you know, it's a mugs game today, trust me. It was all right back then for a younger fella. I wouldn't do it if I was older, but obviously I was young at the time, so for me it was a blast, you know. So anyway, I moved up to Ipswich and I went full time, which was five nights a week for £40 a night, so that's £200 a week, which was enough money then to enable me to go leave my job, work up there full time, move up there with a bird I've met, I left my wife like you do, and all that stuff. So I went up there, and basically during the day you could toss about, train with your pals, and it was a good laugh. So that's what I've done. Now obviously, you want to now go into the robbery, don't you? Yeah, I do, yeah. Um... So what I want to do now is basically just cover the uh, the 1989 Group 4 Security Robbery and how it came about. But before you start, I would just like to state in case any dodgy ex-police officers are watching that it was alleged that you and an ex-work colleague at the Group 4, um, and his name was John Aitken, were responsible for the £15,000 going missing. Um, can you explain to the viewers what these allegations were? Right, OK. Now, I only found about this later on. I learned a bit from John because he told me some of it because I left the company when this investigation happened shortly after this alleged theft. But John was still working there. And also, I was told this by the detectives who arrested us for the bigger robbery later on. What they alleged that me and John had done, let me just explain how it worked. The depot, Group 4 depot, was in Whitham, Essex, and what it was, I worked part-time as a driver, three days a week, I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. 
So what it was, I'd go into Whitham, and sometimes I'd do what's called the trunker run, which is an early morning run, sort of 6 a.m. start. And one van would leave Whitham, and that would drive all the way to the vaults in Wapping, East London. You drive in the vaults, and once you're in there, you know, you can't get a tank for it. And what there is, there's a big sort of bulletproof window at the end with a big drum in the wall. And the van would be parked in the vault, which is like a bigger garage, really, basically, with cameras everywhere, right? You can't sneeze without being seen. And what would happen is, the person on the other side of the vault, where all the money is kept, obviously, I've never had access to that, you can't get through the wall. They would push a shopping trolley, literally, it is a shopping trolley, into the drum, spin it round, and then John, he was always the commander. I never had nothing to do with the paperwork. All I was was the driver. So I would be in the van, and I'd be in the back waiting for John to check the money off on a list, right, and then pass the bags into the van to me. So I never got out, basically, in that vault. Now, John would be taking the bags off, according to whatever of a list that he was given, what was in the trolley. There's cameras everywhere, right? So you count in each bag, and then John would throw it. Boom. So... You know, I don't know how they think that me and John could possibly have taken it, right? Either we've got to be a magician or what, because it's all cameraed up and obviously it's all counted, right? They know what's in the trolley before it comes through. So if there was a bag on extra, say, you know, technically, how is that anything to do with us? Yeah. But anyway, what happened was, I found out later, because shortly after that, I left the firm. And they alleged the bag contained £15,000 and it was destined for Wickford TSB, which is a bank in Essex, Wickford Essex. Now, what happened was, I found out from John that a bag did go missing somehow, right? And then a police investigation took place. And they, from my understanding, what John told me was, they found out that, you know, one person's meant to have access to the money, but literally 10 people could if they wanted and they're not meant to and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, it was a bit like that and it could have been a lot of people potentially who could have taken this back. So someone at the vault or whatever lost their job over it, so John said, and that was it. Now, I never heard no more about it until the morning we got arrested for the bigger robbery. But I'll get to that in a minute. Then what happened was they seemed to believe the detectives who investigated us, Scotland Jar flying squad, dogs at the time, although we didn't know that, because we were naive. Don't forget, we're dormant, not armed robbers. So anyway, they believed that getting away with that £15,000 give me the idea to commit a bigger robbery. Now, if you look at how it all sort of linked together, if we had the inside man, they say, John Aiken, technically it would have been easier for me to still work for the firm and for me and John to just say we got held up by one of our friends without any guns or fuss and just stick to our story. And also, another thing is, 495000 that they say got stolen, which obviously did get stolen, is not even a large amount of money. Them vans are insured to carry up to £1.5 billion at the time. So technically, you know, it was a third of what potentially was available. So, you know, and if they say we had the inside man, then that robbery potentially could have happened any day we wanted. Right? Now, this is what happened. The night before the robbery occurred, I got caught driving a stolen car in Chelmsford. I went back to my mum's, come out and got nicked. So I get arrested. Now, the very next morning, the robbery takes place. The van drives to the vaults in Wapping, and what you're not meant to do, you are not meant to stop anywhere, right? You are meant to fly back from their vaults, all down the A12, straight back to the yard, no stops, right? It's number one rule for all drivers. But what it was, for months, every driver had been doing it. They'd been stopping at this local news agency in Wildbone Lane. The guard would jump out, buy a newspaper, get in, and it, it was... You know what I mean? They've been doing it for months. So it was a standard thing, but you're not allowed to do it. No one was. Now, funny enough, this is quite funny. When the robbery happened, the Sun newspaper, like they do, lying again, had a big headlines, half a million pound, the price of a Sun. But it wasn't even a Sun the geese <laughs> for. It was something like a Daily Express or something. So, you know, that's the bullshit behind it. Typical media. 
So anyway, I get caught with a stolen car. I'm in Chelmsford Police Station when this robbery occurs. I remember the sergeant in the morning opening me up and saying, funny, he said, there's an armed robbery right here where that car was stolen. So I'm thinking, God, you know, whatever. <laughs> like I say, I'm not admitting to nothing, but the police ain't stupid. So anyway, 495,000 got taken. The van was hijacked, taken to Haynold Forest. The inside man, John Aitken, who they said was on our side, gets tied up with the other guard and the money gets taken. Now, because they said I got nicked with the getaway car, they said one of the robbers done it in their own van that got seen. The number plate got seen. So straight away, that we've asked MX detectives for this information. We don't understand how one of my co-defenders never got pulled in straight away. That's right. Questioned on that van. It seems bizarre. Anyway, whatever it was, that's the story behind that. So seven months goes by, and they found no money when they come, no getaway car, no guns, no nothing. Right? What happened was this. As I say, seven months later, I get a knock on my door. It's, it's early, sort of like 5, 5.30. And I was living up in Ipswich at the time with my girlfriend, just me and her. You had John Aitken, the inside man for Group 4, they said, who lived in Whitham. And you had this alleged government, who I'm not going to name, he got pulled in. Tony Tucker got pulled in and questioned at his shop in Ilford, right, he had a supplement shop. Funny enough, I was going to go into it with him before I got nicked because I was at Paddy with him. And the ex-detectives confirmed this on their site, and we've got it all, haven't we? Yeah, we are. That he got interviewed at his shop. Now, that shop was not open till at least 9 o'clock in the morning. That's right, yeah. Right? So, also, he got questioned at his shop. How did he not get questioned under caution and taken to a police station like us? We all got arrested in dawn rates at the same time, coordinated, which is how they operate this one. So, you had the government arrested in London. You had me arrested in Ipswich. You had John arrested in Whitham at, say, 5 o'clock. And you have Tucker interviewed at his shop at nine. Yeah. We all get taken to police stations, separate ones. Right? And that's it. Tucker ain't taken anywhere. And at this so time, David, there was three. two of there was two of the robbers who were still on holiday. Yeah. This is bizarre as well. At the time we was arrested, two of the robbers who did get convicted along with me, they was on holiday in Spain. Now it was the second time since the robbery they had been over to Spain. Now, look, this is another question that we've asked MX detectives to explain because we don't understand it. Right, at the end of the day, if they're over in Spain, right, on holiday, why did you not wait for them to come back, right, and arrest us all together? Right, because potentially, if there's half a million quid missing, which they say there was, then that's a lot of money at the time. I believe that's about two and a half mil a day, right? So back then, that's a lot of money that they could have stayed on the run with. It was a bizarre like decision to arrest us sort of like half the team while the others were aboard. Now, we know the ex-detectives say that they had surveillance on them in Spain. No, they didn't. No. There was none of that brought up in court. That was all bollocks. Right, that's a lie. Now, you know, Craig, that we've asked them this question and they haven't answered none of it. They haven't answered why they didn't put in one of them who used his own van straight away and questioned him. That's right. Why they waited seven months. And B... You know, provide us with evidence of the surveillance because there was none. That's right. right. The other two got arrested a week later when they come back from the airport. Now, basically, what happened with all of us was, look, we're not professional armed robbers, right? We was naive, and as I say, if I'd have thought about it, if I was going to do it, right? Yeah. Then what I'd have done, I'd have just stayed working for the firm. I'd have said to John, look, John, what it is, we'll wait until we've got one and a half mil on board. We'll ring up one of our pals, he'll take us to the forest or wherever, tie us up, he drives off with the money and we just make up a story and stick to it. Obviously, we proved me and John, if we weren't guilty, that we could stick to a story under pressure. Don't forget, this mob are a heavy team, this Scott and Jar Flying Squad. They're not your normal sort of county mob. You know, they're serious players and they'll use every trick in the book. Now, bizarrely, obviously, what they never done with me, because I wasn't actually on the robbery, they never even offered me any opportunity to inform on the others. I mean, I wouldn't have done it anyway. But 
what it was, we all got arrested that morning, apart from Tucker who got questions at his shop, and it was all agreed between all of us that Tucker grasped us. Yep. Right? And we stick to that to today. So that's a fact, right? Because obviously we're arrested at five o'clock in simultaneous rates. Tucker's questioned at nine o'clock or whenever his poxy shop opened in Ilford, right? He's questioned at the shop, not taken to a police station under caution and all the rest of it. So how is that? Yeah. Come on. Right? Simple as that. The old thing stinks. What they said his part was they would question him about passing money backwards and forwards between them in Romford, me in Ipswich, and all the rest of it, and sort of passing messages across. Because obviously, if we had been involved in something like that, we'd all sort of, you know, stick to our own area and not on the phones, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, everyone basically knew what had gone on. So, David, um, yeah. when the officers come round uh, that morning, um, yeah. what happened? This is true, again, that it's around the kids' lives. I don't tell lies. And what happened was, after our appeal, years down the line, I'll get to that later, a squad come down from the Met and the Corruption Unit and questioned me on this Ipswich Police Station. I told them exactly what I'm going to tell you now. Like I said, I swear on my kids' lives, this is true. Right, like I'm going to do that. Now, what it was, I get arrested in the morning and there was two main policemen. I think there was about six or seven of them. They had a woman there because obviously my girlfriend, Hayley Smith, at the time was in the house. She's dead now, bless her. She was in the house with me in the bedroom. So they come round, give them their due. They didn't take the door off. They were obviously armed, but they didn't start pointing guns at us. So I'll give them respect for that. That was good of them. Right, it was a brand new house. I'd have been pissed off. <laughs> so what it was, right here, I'd only been in it a few months. So what it was, they knocked on the door. I went down and I knew straight away who they were as soon as I looked out the window, right? Obviously, their cars are unmarked, all the rest of it. They've come up from wherever in London. This mob are based in Rig Approach, East London, which is now shut down. It's quite a famous um, division of theirs. And if you look at it, there's been a huge amount of corruption involved with this mob based from that division, Rig Approach in East London. So what it was, I let them in, obviously, and they took me into the kitchen straight away. And you had two officers, I can't name them, right? One was a younger one and one was a middle-aged one. And bearing in mind, at the time, I believe I'm 24, sort of that yeah. age, right? So that's how old I was. Hayley was 21 upstairs. So, you know, they got us out of bed. The woman went upstairs to deal with Hayley and question her, but she wasn't arrested under caution. And then she was allowed to leave. Now, what it was, if they'd have gone and searched her mother's home, They'd have found a pump action South African <laughs> sawn off shop, right? They'd have found that. But they missed that, right? So that was good. They never went there. And also, they took me, right, at the time, into the kitchen, like I say. So I remember sitting on my unit above the washing machine. The kitchen was only small. It was only a three-bed house with a built-in carriage and that sort of stuff. It wasn't a big house, like wired up the road. So it was a smallish house. So I sat in the kitchen, and there's two of them there. And... They start going on about, we know you had that 15 grand away and all this sort of stuff. I said, what are you on about? So they started saying about that. That's how I know, right, about it, because we didn't, you know what I mean? We're not magicians, yeah, yeah. are we? <laughs> so that's what they suspected us of doing, me and John. And then, basically, they were saying to me, look, come on, we know you've done this. We know. And I said, look, I didn't done nothing. I don't know what you're on about. But I just denied it. So this is what he'd done, and this is true. He got out a notebook, one of them did, this more senior one, I can't remember his rank now, I believe it was Sergeant. I, got, I know they're not, yeah. but obviously I'm not the same, right? So what he done, and this is a warning to anyone out there, if you do get arrested by the police, do not say nothing, and certainly don't be as stupid and naive as I was at the time, and sign anything. What he done, he opened up this notebook, and he wanted to take um, some items, what he believed were relevant to potential wealth, or some link to this robbery, which was bizarre because the items had nothing to do with it. There was a Gucci watch, what I believe was about £600 value. He took that. There was a pay packet in a brown envelope sealed up with 200 quid in, which was my week's wages for Hollywood Ipswich. £200 on it and wages, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he took that. So there was a watch the wages and there was two other items. I can't remember what they were. One might have been a painting or something. 
worth a few hundred quid, something like that. And then also what they've done, they took as well, they took my Sierra, two litre Geo at the time, where I paid, I think, about five and a half grand for. Up the road, a couple of years later, I got that back. So I got the car back. Now, uh, bizarrely, two of the alleged robbers, the ones in Romford, were driving around in 25 grand and 15 grand motors. They never took them. So it was a bit bizarre how come they took my one. Why well, could easily prove that I paid the jit for? So that was a bit weird. I can't understand this place. But you know, to me, they're dumb. They make dumb decisions, like I say. You know, they didn't put us all in together. They're on holiday in Spain where half a million's missing. You know, it's his poor decisions. I can't work them out. They're here, there, and everywhere. You know, it doesn't seem like a professional investigation. But anyway, this is what they've done to me. This is pure corruption, right? On level one. He had the notebook. He listed the items, the wage packet, the watch, two other silly things. And he said, Dave, do us a favour so we can take these. Would you sign I said, all right, no problem, like a mug. So I signed my name under it. Then what it was, we got taken. I got taken to Epping Police Station and questioned. Now, obviously, I spoke to him. I know the alleged government given no comment statement. Right, and obviously the other two at this point in time are still on holiday in Spain, right? That's right, So obviously yeah. they're going to hear about us getting pulled in. It's, it's stupid, it's dumb. But this is what happened. John was taken somewhere else. Right? Now, what happened was John obviously has to speak to him because he had to speak to him during the robbery. He can't sit there and say no comment, can he? He'll look as guilty as anything. So John spoke to him. I spoke to the police as well. I didn't give a no comment statement. Obviously, they put a lot of pressure on you, but, you know, I stood my ground. I told them exactly what's what, you know, and that's it. And they couldn't sort of break it down, right? And as I say, bizarrely, they didn't offer me because my charge turned out to be eight and the betting. The others was armed robbery. So bizarrely, look, if it was a bit of a weak case, you'd have thought, especially maybe up the road, maybe not at that point, that they'd have come to me and said, look, would you grasp up the others? But they didn't, right? Now, we know, obviously, that Tucker has pinpointed us, right, to get out of it, because at the time, he'd just taken on security firms and all this, and he was, if you like, up and coming. He was a level above us. We were dormant. He was running the doors. Yeah. So he had a bit more wealth than what we did. You see the levels at that yeah. point. Obviously, that one, I paid a thousand times above that mug. But obviously, that was what it was at that point. So anyway, I go to Epping Police Station. I get reminded. Me and John both get reminded. The alleged government walks off. I don't know how because obviously, God knows, you know, they set us up. I don't know how he got out of it, but he did. You know, obviously, he didn't go say they wanted him more than they did us. Yeah, I find that very strange, David. Yeah, yeah again, this whole investigation is, is topsy turvy and bizarre. We, we, we don't understand it to this day. And obviously, we've asked that detective, the one who's investigating, re investigating the Rettenberg, as the older one, you know he is. Yeah. The one who interviewed me in the hotel, in the hood. <laughs> what a joke that was. The hooded figure. Anyway, so we've asked him these questions. Right, and we're going to put these emails out as well. We've got more evidence to show this, but we'll get to that up the road. Where we've asked him these questions. You've, you've seen it, you've got it, haven't you? Yeah, I've, I've, I've put it on my group many a times, uh, asking them these specific questions, and you get no reply from them. Yeah, mate, it's a wall of silence, typical police, isn't it? Yeah. Well, anyway, so we, me and John get reminded in Chelmsford Jail. Now, what it was, when I was in Chelmsford Jail, a couple of weeks later, I get me sort of, papers through statements, if you like. And basically what it is, I've admitted to all of it, right? And not only have I admitted to all of it, also I've signed it, I've signed the statement. So literally I've signed the statement where I've admitted to it. You know, how dumb is that? I remember running into the next cell to speak to a pal of mine called Danny O'Halloran, who's a well-known fella from East London, older fella, old school villain, if you like. And he was in there for a big drugs factory. I remember going, Danny, Danny, look at this. I said, look, this is police statements. I said, they're saying I've admitted this. They even signed it. He went, that's verbal, boy. I went, verbal? What are you on about? I don't know. What's verbal? He said, look, it's what they use, these squads. He said, it's a well-known uh, tactic. Basically, they'll say that you said this on the way to the police station or whatever. Obviously, if you're on a taped interview, you, you know, you're not saying nothing or you're not admitting to nothing. But they'll say you admitted it in the car, this and that. And it's a tactic, sort of a holding tactic. 
So they get enough to take it to a magistrate who believes them, right, and obviously then remind you. And that's basically it. Now, I believe that's as far as you want to go for now, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, basically, what I want to do in this interview is just cover what we've covered today, David. And in the next one, um, we'll talk about your time in prison and how you came to meet Nipparellis and Pat Tate. So if yeah, that's okay yeah. for today, um, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. that's fine. Um, thank you for your time, David. And um, we'll speak soon. Yeah, no worries. Cheers, mate. Yep. Bye.